if you think about the Isaac Asimov novels, he was really one of the first people to talk about what the world would be like in a future where there were real robots, real artificial intelligence. We're getting a lot closer. We can actually have a pretty good idea now what our lives are going to be like soon when artificial intelligence is really here. We'll be able to do things like begin to ask a question, begin to make a gesture, and our personal AI, knowing us as well as it does, understanding the context we're in, will be able to fill in the rest of that sentence, fill in the rest of that question, do the rest of that gesture, before we're even consciously aware that we've started to do it. We'll be able to walk up to any object in the real world, a chair, a doorway, a paper plate, and have a conversation with it. So where are we on the path to that sort of fairy tale future? Well, those of you who've had experience with something like Siri or Cortana or really any smartphone pretty much already know where we are on the path to that. You have a kind of love and hate relationship with these objects. They're close to what we want, but not quite. They don't really understand what we're trying to do most of the time that we are trying to ask them for things, talking to them. So what is missing? Why are they brittle in that way? Basically, they're brittle because they can't answer questions about what it is that they're finding for us in the same way that Google is brittle. So what do I mean by that? What does it even mean for something like you or me or it to understand us? It doesn't just mean parroting back information like this. It means something where it means being able to answer all the obvious questions about that information, combining it. So what do I mean by combining it? Well, if I ask Google, um, when was Barack Obama born? I'll get 100 million hits that tell me he was born in August of 1961. And if I say, who was president in 1961? I'll get 100 million hits that tell me John F. Kennedy was. But if I ask a question like this, who was president when Barack Obama was born? I won't get the answer. Page after page after page, don't mention John F. Kennedy. And why is that? It's because Google didn't really understand the last two things it told me. It doesn't really understand the question I'm asking here. It's like the dog fetching the newspaper for you, maybe doing a good job, but it doesn't really understand what it's carrying in its mouth. So how can we escape from that? Well, how do we as human beings stop being brittle or avoid that kind of brittleness? Um, it's pretty much because we have common sense, or as Cindy would say, because we are able to use pronouns. Uh, so, in essence, our common sense lets us disambiguate sentences like this um, so that uh, we're able to understand that Tom was mad at Joe because Joe stole Tom's lunch. Uh, and if I had changed one word in that sentence, you would have no trouble disambiguating it the other way instead. And it never even crossed your mind for a second that Tom stole Tom's lunch or Joe stole Joe's lunch. And that's because of all the millions of things you learned when you were one year old or two years old or three years old about emotions and the way the world works. Things like if somebody takes something of yours, it makes you angry. And that it doesn't make a lot of sense for somebody to steal something that already belongs to them and, um, and so on. So, what is missing from Siri, from Google, from IBM Watson that still makes that kind of near AI, not quite AI, that still makes them brittle? There are really two things. One is this enormous body of general knowledge, of common sense, of things we learned when we were little kids. Things which are invisible, because since everybody knows them, we never bother saying them out loud. We never bother writing all that stuff down. And the second thing that's missing is the ability to combine those pieces of information, like in the Barack Obama example I gave you, uh, sort of like the way Sherlock Holmes combines clues to reach deductions, which are very impressive. So in his entire fictional career, 
Sherlock Holmes did maybe 400 deductions. You've done that many every day, say, at lunch with your friends, just disambiguating the ambiguous words and the pronouns and the details that they leave out in what they say. So if you think Sherlock Holmes is impressive and amazing, think how amazing every one of us is in that same sense. Now, most of artificial intelligence these days focuses on what you might call right brain thinking, finding patterns in lots of data, sort of the way Amazon and Netflix make recommendations to you based on things you've bought in the past and likes that are similar to yours. It doesn't really understand why it's recommending what it does, but it knows that it will very often succeed because it has just so much data to base that on. Now, is that the only kind of reasoning we want our AI to do? No, we really need both lobes of the brain. We really need left brain thinking as well as right brain thinking. Uh, when I go to the doctor, I want him or her to be able to recognize patterns of symptoms, but I also want them to understand medicine and disease. When I fly in an airplane, it's great for the pilot to have great pattern recognition capabilities, but I also want the pilot to understand what every one of those instruments and controls in the cockpit actually does. So we have to rep represent logical information, this sort of hidden common sense information, not just the ability to statistically find patterns. So how are we going to get all of that common sense written down? And even worse, since it's invisible, how are we going to make it visible? So the idea, the way that you can do this is look at one sentence after another, almost at random. It almost doesn't matter what the visible part is, what the black space is, what the words are that the author wrote down. Introspect on what it is that is the white space, the invisible part, the part that the author assumed the reader already knew about the world, the things the author assumed you would infer from what they did say. And it's that invisible body of knowledge that we have to articulate, we have to write down, and we have to write it down not in English, but in some computer language so that programs will be able to draw the same conclusions from a bunch of these things that you or I or Sherlock Holmes um, would draw. Um, so that's the basic program for getting artificial intelligence. We don't need the the oops, we don't need the billion things that um, are found on Google and in Wikipedia, the facts about the world. We can basically wait on that, get that from those sources once the AI is smart enough to help with its own education. Um, but we still have this large task to do. Now, there's bad news and good news. The bad news is that if we start today, even with almost unlimited resources, to ferret out those tens of millions of pieces of invisible common sense knowledge could take decades. The good news is that we don't have to do that because in 1984, 30 years ago, um, when I looked like I did in uh, this picture um, back at Stanford, I started a project to do exactly that. And now, 30 years later, person millennia of time later, we've actually built up that huge knowledge base, something we call psych. And we're seeing it applied now, something that can work invisibly, almost underneath any application you can imagine, to make it a little bit less brittle. So let's take a real quick look at just a few examples of that. Um, here's a case where we're trying to find relevant pictures, captioned images, given a, um, in this case, a query to find pictures of someone smiling. We don't look at the images, we're just looking at the captions. And if you look at that caption, a man helping his daughter take her first step, you can see that it probably is relevant. There probably is someone smiling in that picture. Well, how do you know that as a human being? Well, you know it because parents love their children, and if somebody you love accomplishes something, it makes you happy, and if you're happy, you smile, and taking your first step is an accomplishment. So if you know those four things, finding this match is trivial. If you don't know those four things, finding this match is impossible. 
So psych knows those four things. It knows those four pieces of common sense. It applies them. It finds this match. Um, oh, and yes, by the way, there is someone smiling in that picture. Not the little kid, but the father. Here's an example where intelligence analysts are trying to put together lists of um, events of a certain type, in particular terrorist events um, in which government buildings in Beirut are damaged, and it finds a match to this story because it knows that embassies are government buildings, it knows that embassies are usually in the capital cities of a country, the capital of Lebanon is Beirut, and pipe bombings are terrorist events. Again, if you know those few things, there's nothing that surprising about the match that it finds, but if you don't know those pieces of general knowledge, then you're just never going to get the answer to that question. Here's a case where we're applying our technology to make new medical discoveries by combining left and right brain sources of power. There's lots of data nowadays that has been accumulating about point mutations in people's DNA and medical conditions like osteoporosis that they develop later in life. So those A to Z correlations from mutation to disease um, are very, very noisy, very weak, they're usually wrong, and doctors hate wasting their time chasing these things down. So how can we help? How can the psych technology help? It helps because it takes those A to Z correlations, and for each one, it tries to put together a rationalization, a causal argument, step by step by step from A to B to C, dot, 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 to Z. And if we can't do that, then that A to Z correlation was probably just an artifact, probably just noise, and we shouldn't even waste our time on it. And even if you can put this rationalization together, often it's wrong, just like often our rationalizations about things are wrong. Um, but a cool thing happens once you have the whole pathway spelled out. Somewhere in the middle, say somewhere around step J, there might be an independently testable hypothesis, a prediction. And then we can go back to the data and see if it's confirmed or disconfirmed. And this kind of exciting synergy back and forth between those two sources of power, the two lobes of the AI brain, between pattern finding and logic, is the way a lot of science is going to get done uh, in the next hundred years. The last example I want to cover is something where we're using psych to help students more deeply understand science and math. So how is that working? Well, obviously you learn a lot in when you're doing homework or when you're in class, but you know as well as I do that a lot of learning also occurs when you're playing games. Um, think of all the kids who really only understood arithmetic when they had to in order to win some uh, Pokemon battles or Magic the Gathering duels or something like that. Um, and the last source of power in teaching and learning there is that often you learn a lot when you're teaching someone else. So think about that. We've all had that experience where we really only understood something when we had to explain it to somebody else. And that might have taken the form of um, you helping a little brother or sister learn to read or sew or some other craft or helping somebody with homework. And so our artificial intelligence application to education, which is called MathCraft, is very different from all the others that you've ever seen. It doesn't have the computer in the role of the teacher. Instead, Psych, the artificial intelligence, plays the role of a kid, a student, someone who is always very slightly more confused than you are about math and science. And so your role as the player in this game is to watch them, help them, mentor them, tutor them, explain to them why they're getting things wrong. And in the process, they will overcome challenges in the game, they'll get gold, they'll save the world. And in the process, you will walk away with a deeper understanding of all the things in math and science that you had to explain to them along the way. If you have the chance to see that at the X Labs Interactive later this afternoon, um, you can come up and get a first-hand look at that and try your hand at MathCraft. So in this short talk, we've taken a look at what the gap is between where we are today with something almost like artificial intelligence and where we want to be with omnipresent, ubiquitous AI 
where our personal AI assistants from cradle to grave will make us, in effect, smarter. They'll amplify our mind in much the same way that electrical devices and appliances amplified our muscles 100 years ago. They'll make us more creative, able to tackle harder problems, able to be less misunderstanding with each other as individuals, smarter as individuals, and smarter as a species, because everybody will have something like this, which is going to be a virtually free appliance, a mental prosthesis. So think about that, a world in which everyone is much smarter than people are today, almost imaginably smarter as individuals and as a species. When was the last time that even happened in human history? You'd have to go back over 100,000 years to the discovery of language. And we look back on that generation of pre-linguistic cavemen with sadness and say, it's really too bad, they, they weren't quite human, were they? Maybe our descendants one day will look back at us, the last pre-AI generation, and say, it's really too bad, they weren't quite human, were they? Thank you. <laughs>